Philip Clark, known as Philip the Evangelist, was called into the ministry at age of 17. Now, in his 70s, he is using modern technology to spread the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. At the end of the podcast, please like, share, and follow. Here's the evangelist. Hi, folks. Welcome back to Philip the Evangelist. We've added a new segment of our Philip the Evangelist podcast. And this new segment is called What Say You? Where I'll be giving my commentary, uh, my thoughts, my interpretations of what I not necessarily what God is seeing, but what I am seeing through news media and other th aspects of uh, things of this world and what's going on now. And there'll be short segments, and I'll give you my ideas of what's going on now. Now, back in 2020, I thought I heard from the Lord and the Spirit said this will be like the Red Sea experience. So I told several people. And then, believe it or not, after that, I heard uh, Prophet Robin Bullock say the same thing. Now, 2020 went by and Biden was, was accepted as the winner of the presidency. And so I'm thinking... Man, I, I don't talk to Robin. I'm not a close friend of his, but I do watch his ministry. But I know he was thinking, saying, thinks, thinking the same thing I'm thinking. What, what happened here? <laughs> I thought the Spirit said, this is going to be a Red Sea moment. <clears throat> well, again, God's space of time is a lot different than ours. It's all about time. Well, we see yesterday, I think, and this is February the 9th, 2024. Yesterday, they revealed the mental capacity of our now president. So, it looks like we've been standing at the sea now for almost four years. We've been standing at the sea thinking, well, we're sunk. We're gone. I mean, they've opened the borders. Uh... Crime is rampant. Soros has got all his, his DAs in the right place in the big cities. They're turning everybody loose. These last four, uh, I call them aliens. They are aliens. They came from another place. <laughs> they crossed our border, beat up four of uh, two cops, broad daylight, on video, and uh, the DA let them go. Now they're saying they need to find them. Well, why did they let them go? But these are the kind of things that's going on right now. And we you'd think that we're sunk. We're absolutely sunk, especially if we have to spend another four years with this economy the way it is and things going, everything going downhill, morals, everything going downhill. So I seen yesterday the beginning of the parting of the Red Sea, I believe. <laughs> Biden has been de declared incompetent. Any way they try to whitewash it, turn it, challenge it, whatever, he's been declared incompetent. He's uh, forgetful, has a lot of a lot of things on film, on video that he's blundered, bringing back people from the dead. So, but you know all that if you watch the news. But. Uh, I feel like this is the beginning of the Red Sea, and I think that we're going to see uh, Christians and conservatives crossing over, crossing into the sea, and then the devouring, the swallowing up, the drowning of this wokeness that's been taking our country over. But I want to I want to quickly bring <clears throat> to your attention if you haven't been watching <clears throat> Teacher uh, Lance Wall now, he's been teaching sometimes, and he's pretty much perfected this message of the seven mountains. Now, the seven mountains, I'm going to name them all seven. And these are mountains of influence. They're places of influence. First is the church or religion. They, The churches have become synagogues of Satan. They've become 
uh, big business mega churches, no power, just membership. Now, there's two kinds of churches. There's a powerful church, then there's a mega membership church. So they've the evil has taken over religion and the churches, but we've got to turn this around. We've got to start teaching the holiness of God, the holiness of God. Without God, without holiness, you'll not see God. So when you hear the preacher on holiness, he's preaching the gospel. But we can turn this around if we turn our churches around. We don't need a revival. That's all I hear is revival, revival. We need revival. Revival's coming. <clears throat> no, we don't need a revival. You say, what? <laughs> we don't need a revival. We need a resurrection. A resurrection's what we need. Resurrection. Yeah, you heard me right. Resurrection, because we've been dead. Dead. The church has no influence anymore. We've got to take over this influence, and the way we do it is by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Repent of your sins and be saved. <clears throat> if my people who's called by my name will re repent, <clears throat> I'll turn things around. He says, God says. The second influence is the news media. They have the news media. If you don't listen to Fox, you don't hear a thing of truth or some Newsmax and some of these others that preach and teach the, uh, the truth, broadcast the truth. You won't go to fake news and hear any, uh, any, any bad thing about our present uh, government. Nothing. They leave it all out. They lie, they twist, and they hate Trump. They hate Trump. They hate Trump. And they've taken our freedom. And they get on the air and say, Oh, Trump's going to demolish or he's going to take away our democracy. <laughs> what a joke liars these people are. Trump is democracy. His middle name is democracy. They have no proof. They just tell lies and hope that the stupid will believe it. Hope that the stupid, gullible people will believe it. <laughs> I'll tell you what's to, who's been taking our democracy, and that's the Democrats. You think I can just say anything on this podcast I want to say? There's certain names I can't. Now, when did that happen? Used to, we used to be able to speak uh, freely. We had freedom of speech. Not anymore. Not anymore. If it don't fit their narrative, they say it's hate speech. It's hate speech. <laughs> or misunder misinformation. <laughs> or bad information. Foes, come on, people. We got to wake up. We got to wake up, stand up, and fight. You better draw your sword. And that's the word of God. And get in it so you can stand and fight. You can't fight if you don't have the sword. You got to have that sword in your heart. Absolutely. Study the word and pray and fast. The next thing is the Department of Justice. They've got that. You know, God showed me also in 2020. This thing is like an octopus. An octopus. They've got us. They've got us. They've got the church and religion. They've, they've infiltrated there. They've got the news, news media. They won't say nothing bad about these enemies of God. And the Department of Justice, which we're about to talk about. This thing is like an octopus, folks. These seven tentacles have us. And I believe it all started with Obama. He's the one that finally closed the curtain on, on uh, uh, controlling everything, every part of our government. It wasn't done overnight. It was a slow process, but they finally got this octopus over us. But we're going to break it. We're going to cut some tentacles off. Absolutely. Praise God. <clears throat> Department of Justice, they got that one. They're not going to prosecute any, any, uh, any of these devils. I call them demons. That's putting it plainly, folks. That's putting it plainly. Demons is what they are. Totally enemies of God and the church. But anyway, they've got the they've got the Department of Justice, FBI, CIA, whole nine yards. But our next president's gonna clean house. Oh, glorious day! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He's gonna clean house. There's going to be people jobless. 
thousands and thousands of people out of job. Well, I'm sorry, you stepped on the wrong side of the street. You went to the wrong side, folks. So goodbye, and I'll be glad to see you go. Next thing is education. They've got education. They're teaching wokeism in schools. Not in my school where my daughter goes. My daughter come home asking me about Martin Luther King and asking me about uh, Mandela and, and uh, all these great leaders, uh, black leaders. I'm all for that. But I, it, it kind of threw up in my mind they might be teaching race, critical race theory. They're not going to teach my child race theory critical race theory, brainwash them, tell them the white man is a devil. Come on, people. <clears throat> We're all alike. I love black people. I love Mexican people. Mexican people are the hardest working people in the United States, I'll tell you that. And and, and people that's come here from all over, Jamaicans. I know J Jamaicans that work three jobs. We got some of our people, we got some sorry tail people, white, black, green, blue, red, yellow. We got some sorry tails. They just want a handout from the government. They don't want to work. <clears throat> I have an African friend. I was taking him to work. He worked at Walmart. His wife's a nurse, worked at the hospital. Just brought over here from Africa because they needed his wife as a nurse. And I'd go into Walmart and he was the one that went around collecting groceries and he'd be flying all over that store. Flying all over, I mean like a rocket, pion, pion. And I see everybody else, they'd be going by the mustard going, yeah, that's mustard, yeah, that's ketchup. Well, one day on the way to work, <clears throat> I told Ali, I said, listen, I said, you're going to be a manager of a Walmart one day. You, you write that down. You write that down. You're going to be a manager of Walmart. It wasn't but a couple months later, they asked him to go up near uh Baltimore, I believe it was, uh, George, Prince George or something like that, some near Baltimore, to be a manager, doing the same thing he was doing, collecting groceries, but the manager, the manager. Then I went in the store after he'd gone, he was gone. I went in the store, I asked one of his co-workers, I said, you miss Ali? She said, no. <laughs> I told Ali about it, <laughs> next phone call he had, and he said, they're just jealous because they've been there longer than me. I know, Ali, you worked hard. You worked hard. And that's what gets you going in America. No matter what color you are. No matter what religion you are. You need to be Christian. I'll tell you that. If you're going to heaven, if you spend an eternity in heaven, you need to be a Christian. So education, they're trying to take it. Thank God in my county, they're not taking it. I called to school. I said, you're not teaching critical race theory, are you? They said, no, sir, Ray, we are not. We were just teaching history. I said, that's fine. I want my daughter to know all about Martin Luther King. He was a great, great leader, a great leader. And Mandela, too, laid down his life. There's a lot of great, a lot of great ones, a lot of great ones. Thank God we're no longer there. They want to keep it there. Al Sharpton don't have a job. If we, if we cure uh, the race problem, he's got to have a job. That's the reason he's always stirring things up. All right, let's move on. Uh, entertainment. They have entertainment. Look at the last uh, awards. Uh, what was it? Uh, the Emmys? They were devil, devil worshiping. Folks, don't delve your family into entertainment because it's, it's wicked now. It's wicked. There's some clean things. I don't even let my daughter wa watch Walt Disney because they've gone woke. But they're turning around just like Bud Light learned. You go woke, you go broke. <laughs> That's right. You go woke, you go broke. <laughs> All right, we got to move along. This is supposed to be a short segment at the, before our uh, our ministry. Okay, next thing is uh, is family. They're 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 interjecting things into the family. Of course, through the education, they're trying to tear down the family, tear down the family. They tried it with our black precious folks. They took. They told the daddy, "You gotta move out if she's gonna get food stamps." They separated the family right there. And a lot of these boys on the street don't have a father to guide them. Don't have a, a leader in the family. God help us. God help us. And they've got the arts and entertainment. That's music. That's the whole nine yards. They have the arts. They penetrated the arts 
and the entertainment. Now, what am I trying to say? What has Lance Wallen now been teaching? We have to infiltrate these places. You need to run for mayor. You need to run for city council. You need, as a Christian, a born-again Christian, we need you. We need to influence. We need to go to the top of these mountains and take them. Take them back. And we can save America. Praise God. Put Jesus in the center of it all. Jesus in the center of all. So, that's my point. My point today, for what say you, is let's take these mountains of influence. You can. You have a talent. God's given you a talent. You have a talent. Take these mountains. You take your place. Starting today, think about school board, mayors, governors. Move right on up. I ran for the state senate in 2008. You don't have to be some superhero to run for for the uh, anything. Run for the House, Senate, uh, uh, run for school board. You don't have to be anybody special. You just gotta have a, you gotta have some some talent, and you got talent. Everybody's got some talent. I ran for the Senate in 2008. Worked hard, campaigned for 10 months. Oh, excuse me, 14 months. I handed out miniature Clark bars and my card. I'd walk into a bank and I'd say, they say, can I help you? I'd say, yeah, I want to deposit in your memory bank, Philip Clark for Senate, North Carolina Senate. I came close. I missed it by 600, 600 votes. That's that's pretty darn close. And everybody in the town said, you did good. You did really good to be a, a, a newcomer to, to Rutherford, North Carolina. And I had, I had, I'd moved there uh, in 2001, so this was 2008, so I was sort of a newcomer, even though my family is from that area. I got to let you go, folks. God bless you. We'll see you in the next segment, which is Philip the Evangelist. God bless you. God loves you, and so do I. Hi, folks. I appreciate you coming on over to our podcast. I hope you enjoyed our new segment of our show. Uh, a ministry of uh, called What Say You? And uh, lots of times I want to give my opinion of what I see is going on, so I just thought this was an opportunity to do that. I hope it was a blessing to you. I hope I said something that you agreed with. And I'm going to ask you right off, please hit share, like, and subscribe. Hit share, like, and subscribe. And please, in the comments section, Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think of the message. If you got something to add or you got something critical to say, that's all right, too. <laughs> I'm a big boy. <laughs> I've been treated every way you can be treated, so you can't hurt me. <laughs> Absolutely. 74 years of God's college, <laughs> college of hard knocks, they say. But anyway, welcome. This is Philip the Evangelist. My name's Philip, and I'm an evangelist. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God for his calling. Even though in the beginning, when he first called me when I was 17, I did not want it. I did not want it. A lot of people are self-called. A lot of preachers are self-called. Our mama called. I was uh, went to my first Methodist conference, Lake Genelesca. Back in 1970, uh, one, I think it was, 71, and uh, went to have lunch. I met this young minister like myself. We were both first pastorates. So we went to lunch, and during lunch, I said, when were you called? He looked at me kind of strange. He said, what do you mean called? I said, when did God call you into the ministry? He said, nobody called me in the ministry. My mother said she wanted me to be a preacher, so here I am. <laughs> I didn't say no more. I didn't say no more. I thought, my, my, my. What have I gotten into? Anyway, today's message is Saul and the Fall. You know, it's one thing to find your calling. It's another thing to stay in your calling. Stay in your calling. I've seen many 
fall into their calling and fall out of their calling for various reasons. And some of the reason, most of the time, the reason is the same as it was the problem with Saul. Now, God didn't want Israel to have a, have a king. Israel was demanding a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. It's like churches today. We want to have us coffee up front and donuts and, and uh, a big auditorium and a mega crowd like everybody else. Well, that was their first mistake. Anyway, they, God wanted to be the, the guide. God wanted to be the principal guide. But he had a spiritual guide, and his name was Samuel at the time. So God spoke to Samuel, and he said, I'm going to give him a king. These mossy backs, they want a king. I'm going to give him a king. But he's going to give him an imperfect king. One that seems perfect, but imperfect. See, if you look behind the lines, you, you see God, what God's doing in, in all, the whole Bible. You can see why he's doing something the way he's doing. He really didn't want him to have a king, but he gave him a man that was appealing to them. He was a tall, good-looking man. Comes from a rich family. A rich family and from the tribe of Benjamin. As you know, if you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that, that the other tribes almost annihilated Benjamin. They got into a fight, and they almost destroyed the entire tribe of Benjamin. Read your Bible, folks. Read your Old Testament. It's some great stories. It's better than any movies you can watch on Netflix. I guarantee you that. And there's more stuff in it that you, you won't believe how much stuff's in it. <laughs> I'm not going to say what kind of stuff, but you need to find out for yourself. A lot of interesting things. A lot of interesting things. So, <clears throat> God was giving them a king. They wanted the king. No hard heads. So he saw Saul. He saw he was a good man. He was a good man. The Bible says he was one of the best men in the land. He was a good man. But you know what? Hell's going to be full of good men and good women. If you think being good, being perfect, being sweet, being nice is going to get you there, going to church every Sunday going to get you there, giving to the poor going to get you there, not. Not unless you go through the door, which is Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come in any other way. Any that does is a thief and a robber. And you're not a thief and a robber. You know the way. Jesus is the way. He is the way. So here's this man, Saul. He was good looking, as I said. And he was tall. Now, I've heard some preachers say that he was part Nephilim, Nephilim or Nephilim. Listen to me, people. Don't believe this Nephilim stuff. Don't believe the Nephilim stuff. Nephilim is gone. There is no more Nephilim. Nephilim was the, oh, excuse me, was the offspring of the fallen angels or messengers that had children with the daughters of men. There's no Nephilim. Your God does not make mistakes. When he brought the flood upon the planet, it was to wipe out the Nephilim. And believe me, some preachers can come up with some tales about the wives of Noah's sons had the spirit, had the gene of Nephilim. That's not so. God is not a God of imperfection. He's a God of perfection. He knew exactly what he was doing. Those girls were chosen. They had pure blood too. It's just that it wasn't mentioned in the Old Testament, but I guarantee you they had their bloodline was pure as well. God doesn't do anything that's going to have mistakes in it. Not. Not a. So don't believe that Nephilim stuff. There's a tall gene. And I told you in the other broadcast, I was coming out of uh, uh, Philippines. I landed in, in Los, a Los Angeles, L.A. And in the airport, I saw this guy. He had to be every bit of eight foot tall. He was looking down at that girl at the desk. 
I didn't talk to him, but I probably he was the basketball player. If not, he's lost out on a lot of money because he was tall. You think he was a Nephilim? If God said, I'm going to destroy everything that lives and breathes, except the what I put in this ark. This ark is Jesus. He is the king. Oh, wait. Anyway, <laughs> God destroyed them all. There's no such thing as Nephilim anymore. There's just tall genes. There's people a lot taller than me. There's people that are shorter than me. It's all in the genes, and it's not Nephilim genes. It could be Anak. That's what uh, Israelites called tall people back in those days. So it's not Nephilim. So Saul was not Nephilim. Neither did he have Nephilim blood in him at all. Saul's father was a powerful man. Saul's father was probably a very rich man, but he didn't know who Samuel was. Now, what introduced this Samuel? God had picked him out. He said, I see Samuel's heart. I know I know he, he looks good on the outside, but he's got potential to be bad on the inside. And it proved to be so, as we go along, you'll see. So they were prominent people, and they were from the tribe of Benjamin. So they believed in one God. They believed in Yahweh. Why they didn't know Samuel? Because Samuel was a spiritual leader of all the tribes. He was a spiritual leader. He was the one that God spoke to first. God wanted to be their king, and he wanted Samuel to be their priest. But that wasn't the case. Oh, mossy backs, they wanted a king. So God said, I'm going to give you a king. Give you a king. So on came Saul. He didn't know who Samuel was, but through a herd of donkeys, he learned who Saul was, I mean, who Samuel was. Now, <laughs> that's an example of just how God uses things, uses people, and uses things to get you into the position he wants you into, or the calling that you're called to. He'll use things to get you there. He used a 30-year-old minister come knocking on my door one evening to grab me into the back, or back, grab me, not back, but grab me and pull me into the ministry. He came in that house first time I saw him. And by the way, let me say this. There's always one person if you think back of every blessing you've ever had, there's always one person that was responsible for you coming into that blessing. One person. Well, this is my one person. I'd been battling the ministry, arguing with God, telling him I didn't want it. I had other things to do. And this young 30-year-old Bob Tuttle Jr. come walking into my little house that night and... Next thing you know, I'm sitting there sobbing, crying. He detected that I was called into the ministry. The Spirit revealed to him I was called into the ministry. So as that, that was my one person that changed my life, turned my life around. You think about it. There's always one person. that uh, and Brother Maddox, uh, I think that's his name. He's, I heard him preach that, and, and I said, that's, that's exactly right. There's always one person. God's got one person. But this time, God used a herd of donkeys. A herd of donkeys. Samuel knew where those donkeys were, and uh, through time, the donkeys came home. But uh, God's used many things to ignite his sovereign will. He really has. So, uh, his most important uh, pitfall, Eli, I mean, uh, Saul's most worst pitfall, I should say, was that he was impetuous and also became self-centered. 
Now, how many people have you known, low-key people, never had a thing, all of a sudden they get something, and their head blows up? Their head blows up. They're bigger than life. They have no time for you. You're little people. I, I can't put my finger on that other than just the nature of a person and pride. Pride. God hates pride. I know so many proud people. They think they are the cat's meow. They think they're the golden goose. They laid the golden egg. And they came from the same neck of woods as I did. Came from the same place as I did. It all went to their head. All went to their head. I've seen ministers, same thing. Go to their head. The church grows, God blesses them. Goes to their head. You know why? Because they think it's me. I, I caused this. I'm the one for this. And that's kind of what happened to Saul. Saul went out to fight the Amorites and he kicked them all over the desert. That's right. God gave him favor and he kicked them all over the desert. And then, he made so many, that gave him the big head. You know, before, before Samuel could even anoint him. He was so bashful, he went and hid at the point that he was going to anoint him king. He went and hid. Now, this kind of fellow was bashful, very bashful. And uh, an introvert, you might say. He went and found him, brought him back, anointed him. So this is where this man's come from. He's come from a bashful, wondering why God chose him for king. Well, it ain't you, pal. It wasn't you. It's just that God knew what you were capable of and were not capable of. It's a game ploy for God's purpose. Anyway, God knew there was a man out there, a boy who was after his own heart. But he knew he wasn't ready for kingship. He wasn't ready for kingship. So, gave it to this man, Saul. Saul's head's, head blew up. Saul went in to fight the Amalekites and God strictly told him to kill everything that lives and breathes. What did he do? Oh, I'm some kind of somebody now. He brought stuff back. He brought the king back. <laughs> he brought back goods. He brought back a lot of stuff. God said, leave it all there. It's a curse. It's a curse. If you bring these people, if you let them live, they're going to come in, mix with your blood, and contaminate your blood. Or they're going to come in and be your enemy one day, turn on you, and become your enemy. That's why I stand with Israel. Stand with Israel. Once and for all, Israel, stop the terrorism. They're in position to stop the terrorism. So go till it's they're all gone. They're all gone is what I say. So, Saul was at the place now. He was Mr. Big Shot. Didn't have, really had to listen to God anymore because he conquered those Amorites. And the Malachites, I whipped their tails too. Even though I didn't do what God told me to do. He... <clears throat> He was like Uzziah. You know, King Uzziah, the Bible says, King Uzziah was blessed to the Lord until he became full of himself, is technically what it says. Till he came proud. Till he came full of himself. We have to be careful not to get full of ourself. I've, I've made a lot of money several times. A lot of money and I don't think there's one friend to tell you I changed I didn't change I tell you when you go through a lot of hard knocks that's the problem these people they jump up in society or monetarily uh, materialistically and it goes to their head they think ah oh this is me that accomplished something Everything, every blessing you have comes from God, whether you want to accept it or not or believe it or not. It does. So anyway, people 
get all blown up and then that's their downfall. That's their downfall. So Saul's down, main downfall, like I said, was uh, he was impetuous. He, he made decisions just right off the cuff. You know, he just, without really thinking, like he went into the temple and offered a sacrifice. Now that's what did it. Once he lost God's favor, once you and I lose God's favor, then we're in trouble. You're on a sinking ship. Once you lose God's favor. Talking about God's favor, I was thinking about it earlier. You know, there's people that, that things happen to the family and, and uh, someone dies, someone's killed, and they'll say, why did God do that? Well, if he was walking, if he was drawing nigh unto him, he would be drawing nigh unto you and protect you. Don't you blame God if you're not in God. You want protection for your kids, your little kids? Then you keep them in God. Keep them in God. You keep yourself in God. You keep yourself in God. Dig into God's will. Seek God every day and he'll protect you. But if you're a mossy bag that just goes to church once a week, don't even crack your Bible, then you don't, you don't have any protection, folks. Then when it happens, you say, why did the Lord do that? Let that happen. Oh, I hate God. He, he could have stopped it. Yeah, he would have. If you had done what the scripture says, draw nigh unto him. Absolutely. And while we're on that subject, let me say this. Listen to me, parents. I don't care how old your children are. Don't sit back waiting for the preacher to bring them into the kingdom of God. You do like I did with my seven-year-old daughter. She was four years old at the time. And uh, it was nighttime. She was getting ready for bed. And I said, Becca. Her name's Rebecca. Spelled the biblical way. R-E-B-E-K-A-H. I said, Becca. You want Jesus to come into your heart? She said, yes, Daddy. I said, okay, let's pray. Let's pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And I prayed. And when I stood praying, she says, Daddy, I felt Jesus come into my heart. And I tell you, she's been on fire for the Lord ever since. Absolutely. She, she ministers at school. She knows, she knows evil. She knows the devil. At her young age, she knows the devil. She tells me when something's not right. She tells me when she saw something and somebody said something wasn't right. I mean, she's in the kingdom of God. She's protected. You are responsible for your children. You're responsible. You bring them in. You bring them in. And if you can't, get saved. Get saved. Rededicate your life or dedicate your life one or the other dedicate your life or rededicate your life get your life straight then you bring your children in and your children will be saved and your children will be protected protected don't wait till it's too late don't wait till it's too late set your kids down ask them what if they would like to receive jesus as their personal savior you can do it as a group if you have more than one or two or individually but don't wait for the, the the preacher or the pastor to save your children you you are responsible for them okay so back to the last message i didn't mean to go down that uh glory hole some people say rabbit hole i call it a glory hole <laughs> but i'm glad i did because you needed to hear it you needed to hear that. Take heed. Take heed. Maybe something's going to happen soon. You better take heed. Better take heed. So, poor old Saul started out on good ground, just went south. Went south. Thought he was so big he could just, heck with Samuel. I don't need Samuel. I'll go in there and offer up sacrifice myself. I'm some kind of somebody. <laughs> You know, it's amazing. Kind of reminds me uh, in the service. I spent three years in the army, and uh, 
I noticed everywhere I went, I'd see cowardly, shy guys. They'd go out and drink and then come back to the barracks drunk as a cooter, want to fight everybody. Why? Because they don't have the courage when they're sober to fight everybody. <laughs> That same kind of attitude hits people when they get prideful. When they get when they get to the place they think that they have succeeded. I have succeeded. I got plenty of money in the bank. I've succeeded. I had a buddy one time, couldn't find a girlfriend. One night, I was kind of down in the dumps. This is some years ago. I was down in the dumps and he decided he was going to take me out to dinner and and uh, lo and behold, that night, he met his girlfriend. She was beautiful. He wasn't a real handsome guy. I mean, he's a good-looking guy, but he wasn't a real handsome guy. But it really went to his head. He thought he could have any beautiful woman he wanted. It really blew his head up. That's the kind of things you don't want to happen to you, folks. It doesn't lead you anywhere. It takes you down a one-way street. It takes you south, not north. Okay, so I'm going to close right here. I just wanted to teach you a little bit about Saul and the fall. Don't you fall in the same holes that Saul did. You think about it. You humble yourself. If you got lots of money and you got things, you live in a beautiful home, don't think you succeeded. You you brought that on by yourself. You collected that by yourself. You were blessed by that by yourself. No, you were not. God gave you the source. God gave you the strength. God gave you everything to make that happen. And if you don't want to give him glory, then God help you is all I got to say. God help you. But I'm going to close. But first, I'm again reminding you of the vision I had when I first started this podcast podcast last January it might have been the first podcast I had a vision and I don't have visions too often but I had a vision and uh, I, I was in a boat standing in a boat and I looked out in the water and I saw hundreds maybe thousands of people but they were all had on life jackets and none of them was swimming towards me and I'm sitting there with a boat to rescue them None of them. They were looking other directions. It took me a couple of days. I wrestled with that. I said, God, what did that mean? Finally, one day, God told me. He said, that life jacket preserver is what people rely on. It's what's holding them up in the world. It's what's keeping them up mentally, financially, in every way and keeping them from coming to me. That's their excuse. That's why they weren't coming to your boat, because they didn't want to be rescued. They were floating with their excuse, and their excuse could be money, fame, anything you can think of. So if that's your case, I want you to get in a boat this morning or afternoon, whenever you're watching this, I want you to get in a boat. Get in the boat. I'm going to pray for your salvation. I'm going to pray that you be converted right now, today. Today's the day for salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not come Sunday. Now, now, now is the time for you to repent of your sins. Turn your old man away and let the new man come in, come forth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, God doesn't take you out of the world. As Jesus prayed, he said, Lord, keep them from the world. Keep them from the world, not take them out of the world. So let's get your old man dead, and let's get the new man Jesus alive inside you. And cleanse your heart of all your past sins and the guilt and the shame that you're carrying around. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've killed someone, had an abortion, caused someone to have an abortion, part of an abortion. I don't care what you've done. Jesus 
will forgive you everything. Now, if with the whole heart, give it to the Lord Jesus. Give it to him. You say, I don't want to get rid of it. If you do in your heart, then that's exactly what's going to happen. Let's pray right now that you come to the Lord Jesus. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you now to give you my life, to lay my sins down at your feet. Take my sins and my guilt away from me right now, Jesus. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for our sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me now, right now, for my sins. And I pray this in Jesus' name. You're a new person. You're a new person. If you prayed that prayer with me sincerely, you are a new person. Brand new. Don't go back to the, to the pit you came out of. Be careful. Satan will try to tempt you. He'll bring your old friends and bring your old life right back to you, trying to tempt you. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Get in the Word of God. The Word of God is what makes you strong. It feeds your inner man, makes your, man, your inner man strong. So start off right away with fueling your new spirit, fueling it with the Word of God and with prayer and with fasting, if you can or if you will. Praise God. I praise God for you. I really do. Now you go. And don't turn back. Repent means to turn around. You've turned around. Now move forward. Seek God. Seek a fellowship that you can uh, enjoy the Word of God and enjoy that fellowship with. Find one. They're out there. And if there's not, there's lots of preaching on the TV. And that's no excuse. Excuse me. It's no excuse to stay home, but get the word however you can. Now, right now, I want to pray for the sick. I want to pray for you that's got an ailment. Now, Mark 4, 36, Jesus said, after he calmed the storm, disciples were having heart attacks. They went and woke up Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you know there's a storm out there and we're going to all die? Jesus got up. He said, have you no faith? Have you no faith? He said, winds be still. And they were amazed that the winds listened to this one man, this one person. They were amazed. Mark 4, 36. I want you to have faith. I want you to believe. The only reason you're sick, the only reason you have this ailment is because of disbelief. Most of all, if you're not a Christian, I want you to ask God to come into your heart. If you're not a Christian, you need healing. You ask God to come into your heart, forgive you your sins. Forgive you your sins. That's the main thing. But I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. And if you'll receive it, you'll be healed. I don't care what it is. I want you to touch it. Is it your heart, weak heart? Is it shoulder? Is it your arms? Is it your head? Are you having mental problems? Christians don't have mental problems. And Christians don't get possessed of demons. And don't you let some preachers tell you that. There's no such thing as demons possessing Christians. Sweet and sour water does not come out of the same fountain, the scripture says. You cannot be filled with a bad spirit when you're full of the God spirit. They're lying to you. They're, they're delivering mossy backs. They're delivering people that are backslid or never been saved that say they're Christians and they're just churchgoers. No born again Christian can be possessed. Trust me. Amen. That's the facts. Now I'm going to pray for you people. And I want you to get healed. I want you to believe God's going to heal you right now. I'm going to put my hand out here. And I want you just to point your hand towards my hand. You don't have to touch my hand. Just point your hand towards my hand. And I'm going to pray right now the power of God hits you and heals you. And you give God the praise for it. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm going to ask something of you, Lord. For every person that has their hands up, point towards my hand. 
I'm going to ask you, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, to touch their infirmity. Touch their bodies right now. Heal them. Heal them. I command it in Jesus' name. Jesus, Yeshua, Homoshia, be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Hallelujah. Praise God. I felt that. I felt that. I really did. God bless you. God bless you. You pray for me. You pray for all the other ministries as well. And uh, please hit that like button, the share button, and subscribe. Above all, subscribe. That's like giving us an offering. A lot of these preachers will tell you, oh, it's just so you'll know when the next broadcast is coming on. <laughs> I'm honest, folks. I'm honest. The more subscribers we have, the more this ministry will be blessed on YouTube and other platforms. So you want to give us a donation? Don't reach for your billfold. Just take your finger and poke the subscribe button. And you'll be blessed. You really will. All oh, this to be given and receive. Amen. Praise God. Until next time, folks. Come back to see us. This is Philip the Evangelist. I'll see you next time. God bless you and keep you. Thank you for joining us today. If you have been blessed, please subscribe, like, and share. Until next time, remember, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Prayer is the key.